The following program is a Podcast One.com production. He started in a small town in Texas. Worked his ass off to become one of the most famous wrestlers of all time. We're going to take care of business tonight, and that's the bottom line. And now he's dominating the world of on-demand audio. And he's doing it for the working man. This is a damn good outlet for me to spew the bullshit off my brain. This is the Steve Austin Show. Unleashed. 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 All right, man, I'm sitting here with Pat Patterson. Pat, welcome to the show. How long have I known you? Oh, well, when you first came to New York. 95, then I guess. 95. And you started in what year? In the business? Yes. 1958. 1958. I've always known you just as Pat Patterson, the, the guy who was the, the agent and helped guys with their finish. And here's the thing, as you know, because you've been around uh, for so many years in so many different territories, in, in New York specifically, guy comes in with the different agents. You know, I was kind of a, a Black Jack Lanza guy. Exactly, I was going to say that, yeah. He was a guy that kind of handled, you know, yeah. my matches in, right? in, in the book. We're, we're sitting here talking about Pat's new book. Mm-hmm. It's called Accepted. I read this thing from cover to cover. And shit, let me just backtrack, Pat. The book is mesmerizing. You live <laughs> such a hell of a fun life. I mean, it, it had its ups and downs, you know, your high spots yeah. and your low spots. Yeah. But it's a very fun book to read. And I thought what we try to do in our conversation, given the short prep time I had for it, uh, I could sit there and go chapter by chapter and take you through the book, but that would be giving the book away. So I just kind of wanted to pick your brain, shoot the shit, and yeah. just talk about the business and coming up. Well, I'll tell you what. When you first came here, I remember that. I remember it was somewhere in San Diego or in L.A. somewhere. And you were not Stone Cold. You were the ringmaster. The ringmaster. And you went out of your mind. And I remember you were screaming at somebody and all that. And I said, I don't know what's going to happen. You hated that fucking name, did you? Dude, they they called me up. Vince called me, and I was in Atlanta. I just gotten let go, and I had a busted arm. And he, you know, I'd been working for uh, ECW. Thank, thankfully, Paul Heyman called me, and I got a chance to learn how to do a promo or start the learning process. Yeah. So no, when, when Vince pitched me the ringmaster, I'm thinking to myself, this is the dumbest shit in the world. <laughs> but it's my foot in the door because Pat, we'll go over this in the conversation. Two times Vince had talked to me, but I knew he. He only wanted to bring me in as a mechanic. This time he was at least pitching me a gimmick. It was a bad gimmick, right. but it was a foot in the door, and the promoter wanted me. It wasn't right. me wanting to go because I had to, which was the case. Right. But as you know, you, you oh, just yeah. don't want to have to make that phone call yeah. these days. So, no, I didn't like that gimmick at all because it wasn't right. going to go nowhere. No, it's not you. Yeah. And with all due respect to Ted DiBiase, who was my manager, and I got on YouTube and I watched an old match with you working with Ted. Tremendous. Yeah, yeah I loved it. Uh, you know, as good as Ted was, I just learned to start talking. So he was he was a hindrance. And I say that with respect because he's one of the greatest workers that, that I ever saw. I see. But there's, that was a dead end. <laughs> but my point yeah. is, so, uh, yeah. you know, uh, the whole time that I was here in WWE in my career, you helped me out many, many times. But you were... I wasn't in your your clique. You you were Rock's guy. You were you were everybody's guy. Well, yeah, but, you but focus on your different main guys. I remember a few times with you, you know. And first of all, talk about Stone Cold Steve Austin. You had a character that was strong as it could be, and you were a pro. And I remember a lot of times when you were in the card, you were watching backstage. You were watching the matches. You want to see who was doing what, you know, because you don't want to do the same thing. And occasionally, sometime when you knew what you had to do for the match, and you would say, Pat, what kind of fucking shit is this? That fuck, I, God damn it. You know, Steve, calm down. Maybe we can come up with something else. Yeah, they better. You know what I mean? <laughs> A few times, I said, well, well, we will come up with something, you know. So this way, it was, it's easier to come back and say, what if we do it this way or that way? Well, damn, that sounds much better, you know what I mean? <laughs> and after that, you were easy to play with, you know. But we all had to, we're all that way. We have a new character, and it, it, something is not working, you know what I mean? And then somebody says, somebody what about this way? Oh, okay, you know. But did you get the sense that I had a bad attitude? No, no. Because sometimes when I hear dealings on myself, I was a little ornery, but I mean, I was so hungry. I'd been 
fucked around for seven and a half years. You were paranoid about that. I had a chip on that. my shoulder. Yeah, yet you were paranoid about that. And then all of a sudden you hear something and you get really upset. Is anybody else, did anybody else go to you and says, well, you know, calm down. Calm down. I'm going to go have a sandwich, the uh, catering, and be about an hour from now. We'll sit down and talk. You know, sometimes guys get mad, and they don't want to do this. Okay? Give me some ideas. So I love that. I love that. Shawn Michael, these guys. I just love to help somebody that, because we all get stuck. We all need to be produced. That's what you say over and over in the book. Yeah. And go on, let, let's, let's go back to uh, when you were a kid uh, growing up yeah. in uh, Montreal. And, dude, there was 11 family members in your house. Was it a condo or an apartment? It was an apartment. It was an apartment with two bedrooms. Two bedrooms. 11 people and no running water. And running water with just cold water, no just hot water. Just cold water, okay, so you had to heat it up in the, in the kitchen on the stove exactly. to take a bath. Exactly, yeah. But then you would have the bathhouses down the street. Yeah, and your mother but in, would... my, in, the, in the house, it's two bedroom, one kitchen, but there was one toilet, Yeah. no bathroom, no shower. You had to wait in line to go to the bathroom. And then when you took a shower, your mom would give you a sliver of soap, yeah. and you'd go down to the public bathhouse, yeah. and then she would ask you for the sliver of soap when you got yeah. back. Oh, yeah, you have to. Yeah. So nothing was ever handed to you. <laughs> no. No. Pat, as a kid and reading a book, you're always looking for an audience. Yes. Why was that? I mean... I don't know. You know, I'm one of my brothers, he was about two years younger than me, and he was good at playing hockey. It wasn't me. I don't know what it is. When I was a kid, I was an altar boy, and I'm with the priest. You know, there's a big you know, wedding, you know what I mean? Then I'm with the priest. I'm dressed like him. I give him the, the, the ensign or whatever. I'm in front of the people. You know, I, said, I like that, you know. And then later on, I watched the ice capade, you know. And the, yeah. God damn, I like that. And in my neighborhood, every kid play hockey, right? I got a pair of figure skate. And I'm skating with the girls like this. Hey, you faggot! You know, because I had those kind right. of skate. They didn't know what it was, but I'm doing, you know. And I went for an audition when they came to Montreal. My father said, you're not going anywhere. I was too young anyway. Circus. There was a circus outdoors, you know, and I would hang around, try to go on the trapeze and everything else. I would have left with a circus, anything. I don't know what it is. I went up to perform in front of people. Don't ask me why. I don't know. In the book, you wish you would have had the guts at that time to do it. You didn't. You waited around. Yeah. And just by chance, with uh, as many family members as y'all had, I don't know what it was because you're Catholic, right? Yeah. So I guess y'all started eating just bread. On one day of the week, or was it on Lent, on one, one occasion? Because <laughs> no. this leads to you going and seeing yeah. your first professional wrestling match. Yeah. Tell that story, because uh, there was a free ticket and a loaf of bread. Oh, yeah, a loaf of bread. What I said, my, my mother would buy two or three loaf of bread, but once in a while there was a ticket on the, uh, and you get a free ticket to go to the wrestling matches. I went there and I went crazy. It was not a big, big place now. It was a small place, maybe five, five, six hundred people. I was going crazy. And I hated that villain. You have no idea. And I'm standing up, beat that shit out of him. Come on. I was going crazy. I got hooked. And then I found out later on in school, there was a kid and his father was a promoter. He was my age. So... I talked to him, I says, you're going to come to the gym that I go to. There's a place that was a ring, and we I want to train you a little bit, you know. He said, no, my dad doesn't want us to wrestle at all. Don't worry about your dad. So I took him to the gym a few times. Then I went to his house, and I talked to his dad. I says, you know, I, your son, he's pretty good in the ring. What do you mean? I says, we've been training. He says, don't you talk to my son. But don't even train my son. Holy shit. And he was, he was good, you know, so I didn't say a word. About a month later, I says, sir, why don't you give us a chance one time in the preliminary match? Well, I'll think about it. So one day he did put us in a little town first match. My God, he was, he was so happy. And then I was in then, and all the old timers, kid, you can ride with me, you know. And that's how I got involved in the wrestling in Montreal. At that first match you went to, though, off the uh, ticket from a loaf of bread, you got a chance to see Buddy Rogers, and you said when he walked 
his entrance captivated you, and then his ring performance, like you said, you were going banana. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what was it about that guy, Buddy Rogers, which was so magnetic because he's one of the greatest stars in the history of the business? You would go on to become friends with him and wrestle him on yeah. many occasions. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Buddy Roger, when I first saw him in Montreal, and he just walked, and he had that walk, and you. He looked like a star. He looked like somebody. You know what I mean? Now, about a month or two later in Montreal, I have no money to get in the building. But these guys would park their car. Buddy Rogers got the suitcase, and he's walk across the street. Me, carry a suitcase? All right, kid. And I walk in with them. I'm in. Kowalski, same thing. I get the suitcase. So I was, because I didn't have any money to get in. So many years later, I'm interviewing Buddy Rogers. I'm in Japan with Kowalski. <laughs> it's got a long way, you know what I mean? But it was Amazing. tough when, you, when you're talking about carrying that suitcase, when you say, me carry suitcases, yeah. because you only spoke French. Yeah. Your English was the shit. That's right. I tried. Me yeah. suitcase. What the fuck? <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> so your first lessons, because the promoter was Silvio Sampson, correct? Yeah. And so you find someone to teach you a little bit, but yeah. you end up basically they're stretching you more. More than they're teaching you. Oh my God! Yeah. Was they it the same shit that like, just same. years and years just to try yeah. to weed you out or not smart oh, yeah. you up? Well, being a preliminary match kid, you want they bring me in the in the ring somewhere. You want to you want to learn? Okay, and I go and they stretch the hell trying to get out of there, and blowing up. You know what I mean? But I kept coming back. I kept coming back. The and uh, the first uh, few wrestling matches you had, and like you said, you guys were hitting it off. The, the, the father, the promoter, was impressed. Yeah. But one of the things that uh, kept happening, a lot of your paychecks were bouncing. Yeah. And so your father, who you never really had the greatest relationship Well, you really did with, read my book, did you? I read it from <laughs> cover to cover. We're going to start freelancing here in a minute, but yeah. I, I want to set the tone because the, the biggest thing for, with you is – you're one of the greatest minds in the history of the oh, business, come on. and especially as it pertains to the finishing sequences and stuff like that. So I just wanted to get to how you went That's a all big compliment processes. coming from you, I'll tell you that. That's a true story, and you know <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. But so your dad, uh, you know, the paychecks are bouncing, and yeah. your dad doesn't want you to be a professional wrestler. He says, get yeah. a real job. Right. What was it about the 9 to 5 grind? With all due respect to everybody that's working 9 to 5 listening to the podcast, you know, me, myself, you know, when I got out of college and started doing this in 89, this was a job for me. When I took a test, Pat, in high school, it kind of points you in the right direction. When you fill in the little circles, it said I would make a good park ranger. I didn't want to be a park ranger. <laughs> so I want to be a professional wrestler. Oh, God so damn. what was about the 9 to 5 or just a regular job that was so abrasive to you? I work in the factory where they, uh, they make ice skate and shoes. And that... They put that on the no, 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 thing, and then I might have to put them in the box. And they had all day in, day out, day in and day out. What the hell? I'm not going to do that in the factory. I got fired. So I had to get another job at the cookie factory. Huge place. I lasted three weeks. I told her to go to, go to hell, yeah. and that was it. My mom and dad screaming, you can't keep a job, for Christ's sake, you know. Then I tried a big factory in the behind our house, cigarette factory. It's huge. And if you get a job there, you're there for 40 years, and you're all set. You know how many times I made an appointment there? At least 50 times. And the girls go, sir, you came here last week? No. I said, I know. And I'm glad they didn't take me. I'd still be there probably. It wasn't for you? No. Uh, growing up uh, in the book, you really admired Killer Kowalski. Yeah, I guess you wore purple trunks. You would wear the same when you started. Right. God, what you was can't it? Read the book, Steve. No, I can't. <laughs> I don't fuck around. Wow. Pat, what was it about <laughs> Killer Kowalski that said that he was just your hero? He was vicious. I mean, he was mean. Thank you. He was mean, and he had the purple boots, purple tights, but and purple jacket. I had some made for me, man. That was like a young Kowalski. And it's a funny thing. The first time he saw me wrestle, I was in Boston. And the promoter in, in Boston brought in Kowalski and a couple of guys, yeah. top guys. I said, oh, my God, I'm in the same car as Kowalski. Now I was in the locker room. I was afraid to put my boots on because I got the same thing. <laughs> Maybe he's going to give me shit. What the hell is that? Get still in my gimmick. I know. <laughs> in fact, uh, the promoter says to Kowalski, he says, I was in the first match. I said, Kowalski's going to watch you. I was a nervous wreck. I played in the red match. Bing, 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 about 10, 12 minutes. And I came backstage. He said, 
Did a good job, kid. Oh, God, I was in heaven. I was in heaven. And then later on in years, I was in Australia with him, and I was in Japan, and I, I tortured him. You know why? Why? Because he has a hard time. He's a vegetarian. Yeah. He has a hard time eating, and I would order food for him that was not good. <laughs> I said, there, they brought you this. I don't want that. Another rib you pulled on him when he would go to the bathroom, you would put chicken in his rice and do stuff like that. And he'd have to reorder again. Oh, everything. You were terrible. I know. You're one of the biggest ribbers in the history of the business. Oh, That's one God. of the things. I have this book here, and, and because look at all the dog-eared pages, Pat. Those are ribs and funny stories. <laughs> My book is torn up because there's so many ribs of yeah. you we'll get laughing to that your ass off. Through through that. Yeah, we'll get yeah. to it. Yeah. But I've got to get to something else else first the carnivore club hey if you're a meat eater then this is the club for you carnivore club is a monthly subscription service that sends four to six premium quality cured meats in every box and each box features a different artisan and a totally different selection like wine the craft of cured meats is an art form that requires endless hours of trial and error to perfect the recipes and with carnivore club you're going to get everything from chorizo to rare exclusive stuff like Wagyu beef and Iberico ham. You'll also get some of the hard-to-find artisan meats like water buffalo and cranberry salami. And you can choose a membership plan that works best for you, monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly, or you can purchase a one-month box to see how you like what Carnivore Club has to offer. And right now, you can go to carnivoreclub.co to join the club. That's carnivoreclub.co. This also makes a great gift for the meat lovers in your life. And if you sign up now at carnivoreclub.co and use my promo code Steve, you'll save 15% on your first box. So go to carnivoreclub.co, use my promo code Steve, and save 15% off your first box. One of the things I like about the book is how you wrote it. Because anybody that's ever spent any time with Pat, if you know him, it's the book... It's just like he's telling you the stories. He'll start getting ahead of himself. He'll go back, but wait, we'll get to that in a minute. We're still here. That's how the book is I'm like. I'm relaxed. I'm having a blast now. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I'm having a blast. Stuff. But this is, man, other than having drinks at a bar, being in a finished room, I mean, we just we never really got to just hang out and shoot the shit because, yeah. you, man, you're, you live where you do. I live where I'm at. We're, we're both busy, but our common thread was a business. <laughs> I want to go to Killer Kowalski because you said because he was so goddamn mean. So let's segue here. One of my biggest things these days, because I want someone to learn something in the business, to learn something about the business. A heel, you, I watched, I watched many of your matches. You had a mean streak. Um, many heels, uh, and I got a chance through your book. To, I always remember Lord Alfred Hayes from doing commentary on WWF. I didn't uh, know that that guy even worked, so I got on YouTube, and he was a nasty, vicious heel, and he made you mad because he cheated. And then when it came time to get heat on you, he was a mean prick. Yeah. Explain the importance of a mean streak, Pat, because to me it's so simple. You mean as far as being mean? Yes. You don't just go through the motions. It's with... No, you got to... You take pleasure or it's a passion to fucking instill. Exactly. When you throw a punch, your facial expression, you mean it. You just don't do it for fun. Right. When you grab that leg and you twist it, yeah, I mean, yeah. you got to show me that it, I'm twisting that. You know, that's the whole thing. It's the facial expression is so important. So you're working with Silvio Sampson in Montreal. Yeah. How long were you there before uh, you would end up going down to Tony Santos in Boston? Right. I was uh, in long? Montreal. I wrestled with the kid a little yep. bit. There. And then from there, I had a chance to go. But the promoter from Boston would come in sometime to Montreal, and he's looking for talent, you know. So I go to him. I said, you, uh, you promoter? You, uh, me, go Boston. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He gives me his card. like. Like, he's like trying to tell me to get out, you know what I mean? But I kept that card. And about five, six months later, that's when my dad threw me out of the house. And my sister, like, she gave me 20 bucks. In those days, it was a lot of money. I took a Greyhound bus and went to Boston. You got to go through immigration. I had nothing. In those days, I guess you didn't need a passport. And I said, me, go to Boston, to wrestle. Ah, no, 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 no. I was at the border six to seven hours with the business card they kept calling the promoter finally the promoter answered 
or you got a kid here that uh, is wrestling for you. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went to Boston, and they went to Boston that way. And you'd already started your wrestling career as Pat Patterson because as a shoot, you are Pierre Clermont. Yeah. So you're already Pat Patterson, and they're yeah. waiting for you over in Boston. I, I, I changed my name in Montreal. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, Pierre Clermont. Can you imagine a name of, of a <laughs> champion to start? Pierre Clermont. Give me a break. It didn't really have a really je ne sais quoi to it, if I will. Oh. Uh, tell me how you came up with the Pat Patterson because it's in the book. Okay. You know what? There was uh, two local guys. They were lumberjack. One was, uh, uh, what's the name? Paul Smith, and the other one was Pat Smith, two lumberjack. And I like the name Pat Smith, you know? I mean, I like the name Pat. So I take a dictionary, and the back page of the dictionary, they have the uh, uh, P, uh, what do you call it? P A T. And now, like a the, surname? First, the first, what is it? A surname? Surname, yeah. yeah. So Pat, I like Pat. So now I didn't know what to call the last one. That I took the dictionary and I closed my eyes and I opened the first name I saw was Patterson. Pat Patterson. That was it. Got a ring to it. That, that's been my name for years. What changed when you went to Boston? Because you were in Boston, what, two years? About about two years. And, you know, I learned I learned to wrestle, to travel, all these little towns with different guys. They were the old timers. They liked to play with you and trying to stretch you. But after a while, they like to work with you. I'm not kid. You're taking good bumps, you know. Right. You know what I mean? You, they help you, you know. And I was there for two years. I had a blast. Oh, my God. I was young. I didn't know. I didn't make any money. I was living in an apartment at $10 a, $10 a week. So at, at this point in your life, and l- later on we're going to get to this, yeah. you always felt comfortable when you, when you really started understanding the business. Whether you're working heel or babyface, you always preferred to lead the match. Mm-hmm. But I'm imagining when you get to Boston and while you're still in Montreal, or if you're working with Samson's kid, maybe you were calling a match, but I'm imagining you're still following at this point, correct, and learning? Oh, yeah. But I learned from them. They were telling me what to do. But eventually, and I said, wait a minute, when I'm at my time, I'm going to teach these guys what to do. You know, I came to that level where they started believing in me. You know what I mean? In those days, I just wanted to lead. And some of these guys are just looking at you. Come on. You know, it just felt that way. I don't I know. I bet you're the same way, too. Oh, well, because I don't hear very good. I was kind of legendary. You know, If uh, I'll never forget working with Lawler in Memphis. Yeah. You know, he was a guy that liked to start talking before you even locked up. Right. So he'd be yeah. trying to call the first spot, and I'd be going, what? That. Well, the, the crowd would call a high spot out to yeah. me, so it was ridiculous. I, I just, whether I was working Healer Baby, once I got a, a hold of it, that's when I just started liking to lead the match. Yeah. And that, that's what I felt com- comfortable with. Uh, it's funny about leading a match, you know, and... That's one thing I had to do. Come on. I just, I couldn't let a guy, they, they, go ahead, go ahead. You lead. Please. Are you going to do something? Are you going to kick my ass? Oh, I do something. You know, I'm waiting for something. No, I'm going to lead the match. I'll tell you what to do. With Rocky Johnson, I've worked with him so many times. Man, I used to give him shit every night in the ring. You lazy bastard. Get your fucking ass up. Come on. You know what I mean? Let's scream at him. Because... If we have a bad match because a bad match because of him, it's his fault. I don't want to have a bad match. Right. So, going ba- going back to those those formative years, man, Pat, it, I can't imagine there was a lot of high spots. It was a lot of holes, working for holes, healing, right. and then one or two spots. But it wasn't a spot fest yet. You're right. Yeah, put a hole and, and make it make the guy suffer. You know, make him tap out or. Years ago, not too many guys would tap out. They didn't want to tap out. You know what? Get pinned, it's okay. <laughs> but, but going back to that day, just, just the fact of two guys grappling uh, just was an attraction in and of itself. Yeah. Because, you know, it was, it, it was still that time. I mean, of course, wrestling had been around in the States for since, you know, before the TV was around. And then yeah. all of a sudden television comes out. It's, it's a natural for TV. But in that day... <laughs> That style just captivated people. Oh, yeah. Two combatants trying to wrestle yeah. for a win or for a championship belt. Right. And so all these years later, the business has evolved so yeah. much. Yeah. 
And you, you're were right. Still Years ago, you grab a hold. He can have a hold on the wrestler for 20 minutes. He can't get out of there. And when he does, look out. You're right. Right. <laughs> it's true. But today, you grab a hold for 20 minutes. Yeah, boring. boring. <laughs> <laughs> hey, in, in Boston, you're out on a town and you meet Louie. Yeah. Your life partner. Yeah. For 40 years. Yeah. And then so you guys uh, become an item. And this is back in the day when the business was protected. And so y'all protected the business. Yeah. But you protected your relationship. Yeah. Louis, you know, about, which is a, it's a long story in a way because I met him in Boston. And I would see him on weekend because he lived outside of Boston. He had a motorcycle. He'd come and spend the weekend with me and go, you know. He was a good friend, you know. But then in the meantime, Mad Dog is in Oregon. He's a star in Oregon. And I don't know how he got, still don't know today how he got my address in Boston. He sends me a letter. Your book in two, two weeks in Oregon. You better be here. Mad Dog wants me to go to Oregon. I had no idea where Oregon is. Then I go to the promoter in Boston. I tell him I want to go to Oregon. He takes a map. I've never seen him back that big. He's like, you're going from coast to coast. To me, it was like going around the world. And he says, you could starve to death. That scared me. I didn't go. About three weeks later, I got another letter from my dog. You, you better get your fucking ass over here. Oh, my God. Now I have to go. I borrowed money from Louis. Flew to Portland, got a little apartment. I stayed in a hotel. Mad Dog was there. So about a couple of weeks later, and I miss my friend Louie, and so Louie flies in. But you were just thinking, hey, man, when you said goodbye to Louie, you know, you were just going to go do your thing. I didn't think I was going to see him, no. And, and he was going to go do uh, his thing. Yeah. That's Pat Patterson's phone going off. <laughs> Anytime someone's phone's going off, they owe me a beer and you a beer. So Pat Patterson owes you a round. I'm sorry. There's a lot of noise. We're right here at the Staples Center. Pat doesn't know how to work his iPhone. This is classic clusterfuck material here on the Steve Austin show. But you didn't figure. You didn't figure. You just figured it was over. You, you'd never see him again. No, I never thought I would see him again. But God damn it, after a while, I'm all alone. You know, I'm in the hotel room. You know, and you, somebody would, one of the boys would pick me up and all that stuff. You know, and I asked him to come to Portland. He quit his job and left his family, everything. I mean, he had a good job in that little fact, yes. little town there. So we're sitting in the lobby of the hotel. i never forget that. On a Sunday night, who comes walking in? Mad Dog. My friend Louie, when he saw Mad Dog, because he heard of Mad Dog before. Mad Dog comes walking in, and he's drunk. And Louie sees Mad Dog. He runs out the fucking door. You brought your boyfriend with you, did you? I says, well, he's my friend. Where did he go? I says, Maurice, I don't know. He, he got scared. Well, we'll go find him. I says, oh, my God. Get in the car. We're driving all the way downtown Portland from one street to the other. And he's going, where the hell is he? Where the hell is he? I said, dog, I don't know. Turn here, turn there. And then he sees him on a sidewalk. He puts the window down. Say, get in the car. Louis keeps running. <laughs> yeah. He steps on the gas and gets on the sidewalk, blocks him. Get in the car! He gets in the car. We're going to go to the bar and talk. I figure he's going to prepare to kill both of us. <laughs> <laughs> we were scared of death. We were sitting. He's talking with Louis more than me. And they never shut up talking. Became the best friend. And they become very good friends. But then, and then this would end up being the case because Louis would, uh, your wrestling always came first. Yeah, always. And he would that. end up following you yeah. to all of the territories. Yeah. And everybody that he met yeah. just loved Louis. Yeah. And so he was just a natural, charismatic guy yeah. and, and just a, just a great person. Yeah. Very, so everybody loved. loved him. Yeah. And Honestly, so I just thought that because a, he's my friend, he was better than me, for Christ's sake. But he was a cool guy. <laughs> yeah. He, he, he was yeah. just in uh But anyway, about Mad Dog. Yeah. But tell me about how how over Mad Dog Vashon was, because I've always heard the stories, and I, I didn't get a chance to see a whole lot of his work, but I just knew that he was very feared and had a ton of heat. Oh, what unbelievable. But he was, when you watch him work, and he's beating that shit out of you, right. you know he is. Right. You know, it's like the facial expression. <laughs> And I mean, God, he was was unbelievable. And you know what? When I went to Oregon, he wrestled a guy by the name of, uh, what's his name? 
Oh, Sh- Nuts Thomas. Anyway, a, a black wrestler. He was very good. And I'll never forget it. In Seattle, he had a one-hour match. I've never seen that before. A one-hour match. Luther Lindsay. Mad Dog versus Luther Lindsay. A one-hour match. I didn't know the match was going to last an hour. I could not believe at the end of the match, people were going insane. I've never seen that. I couldn't believe it. First time you see a one-hour match together. Right, right. God, you should have seen that match. These guys that were both wrestlers, they wrestled, you know, and that dog sometimes would go crazy and they'd come back into the wrestling. Oh, it was, it was unbelievable. So why did, why did you consider, because Don Owens was running uh, Portland, yeah. and uh, so he was a promoter, and you started in Montreal, went to Boston, but you consider um, Portland to, to really be where you kind of – started filling your yes. own or filling your own yeah. you had television exposure you were getting over yeah uh, at what year was this in the business why were you who was teaching you what was clicking with you was it the reps was it the time in the ring and then one of the guys i worked with you know and some of the old timers and i took a lot of bumps from there and everything else and i have i've learned all that but uh, some guys in Portland's a nice little territory. For example, Nick Bockwinkel was there at one time. Uh, Pepper Martin was a good worker, and he was there. So all these guys that I didn't know, you know what I mean? And then Pepper Martin goes to a promoter one night. He says, let me work a program with the kid. God damn it, he's good. So Pepper Martin was a top baby face. We couldn't wait to work with each other. First match we had, it stunk. He's talking to me in the ring. I can't do that. I'm talking to him. He does not listen to me. <laughs> Pepper, next time, let me lead the match. And after that, we became the best of friends. He was so good. Tell me uh, the story about Nick Kozak, because in your book, you said this guy could sell his ass. Oh, my God. <laughs> he taught you a different level of work because this dude would sell, sell, it, sell. Yeah. And because he was so great at selling, the people would go crazy oh. when he made his comeback. You know what? But you're that just... was an eye opener for you That's at right. that time in your life. Exactly. Put a reverse headlock on him, and you hold on to it, and you know he's trying, he's trying, he's trying. He's almost got it. Yeah, he got to pull the hair. My God, they go crazy. He pulled the hair. No. Hey, sometime for fifteen minutes, and he would fight it and fight it back down. I said, "You gotta get out." Don't worry, stay there, stay there, you know. Then yeah. when he came out, man, oh, Jesus, that was that easy. So you went to San Francisco after Portland, and I want to get into how you ended up going to work for Roy Shire. But first, let me switch gears for a second and get into some football. Football is back. Preseason has started, and I know y'all are scouting players and stats to get in on fantasy football action. And you know the best place to do that. It's at DraftKings.com, and if you use my promo code UNLEASHED, you can play for free with your first deposit. So put your knowledge to the test and play for your shot at the $1 million top prize at DraftKings.com. And that's just a small part of the $5 million in total prizes they're doling out in this week one contest. And you know DraftKings.com is the destination for one-week fantasy football and One week means no season-long commitments. It also means you play whenever you want with the players you want. And it's easy. You pick your contest, draft your players, and follow your team live. You can create and play in a private league or join an existing league and go head-to-head with friends, co-workers, and fantasy players from all across the country. So hurry to DraftKings.com to choose your players, and you could win some serious cash in week one. Use my promo code UNLEASHED and play for free with your first deposit. That's promo code UNLEASHED to play for free at DraftKings.com. That's DraftKings.com. Eligibility restrictions may apply. See website for details. That about, is, so you, you were in uh, Portland, uh, what, about 18 months? Yeah, maybe take? a couple of years, yeah. A couple of years? And yeah. then uh, you go to San Francisco to work for Roy Great Shire time. and Big Time Wrestling and 65. Yeah. So i got to hear about Roy Shire because I heard that he was just a cantankerous guy. He watched every single match at every single show, and he was always yelling. Mm-hmm. Is this true? Please explain to me about this Roy Shire. Yes, sir. He, watched... he didn't initially like you. No. At first, he didn't like me. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, at first, he did not like he me did at not all. At all. 
But you know the story that I told him before I got there, right? No. Oh, you didn't know that. I was in Portland. And in Portland, Pepper Martin was used to work in in, uh, in San Francisco in a couple of years before that. Nick Bockwinkle has worked there before. So these guys are telling me, said, Pat, you ought to go to San Francisco. And you and Ray Stevens would make a good team. I didn't even know Ray Stevens. I says, well, I don't know. Well, you should go there, you know. So I did the usual thing, sent pictures, you know. And then I called Roy Shire about a week or two later, and I says, Mr. Shire, I says, uh, I'd like to work for you and uh, have a date. You know, Nick Bachwinkle told me it'd be good. And Pepper Martin said, we'd make a good tag team. He says, the boys don't do what I No, I do the day. The, the, that I do the... Uh, I nothing. tell the boys what to do. They don't tell me. That's exactly right. You know, so I said, okay, no problem. So he gave me a date, and I went to San Francisco. My first night, I, I had a little apartment in San Francisco. He said, how are you going to go to Fresno? It's 200 miles from San Francisco to Fresno to do TV. So I ride with him in his pickup truck. Got a pickup truck. He's got a gun, you know. He got a big wrench, anyway. So... Go to the, go to do TV, and after we're done TV, I get in the truck with him. I'm having a few beers. He goes, "You better start working out. You look like shit." I said, "Holy Christ Almighty!" You know, I I wasn't really into workout thing, you know. And then he says, "I heard some them shit about you." I says, "What'd you hear?" He says, "Well, you're different." I says, "What do you mean different?" He says, "You're different." I says, "Well, I'll tell you, I'm gay." He says, you dumb shit, you admit it? I says, Roy, I'm going to work for you. You might as well fucking know. He said, you're stupid. He says, I'm not. I'm just telling you I'm, I'm honest with you. So now I got home. My friend Louis is waiting for me. I says, I don't think we're going to be here too long. <laughs> right. He told me about work out, and he's telling me about being gay. Jesus Christ. I was there 15 years. Yeah, I know. It is on the uh, on the, uh, first of all, before we get to the back end, because this is when uh, he would start hit, helping you or dropping finishes on you or just discussing yeah. finishes with you. But before yeah. that, you finally ended up doing what you said you were going to do. You hooked up with Ray Stevens. Oh, yeah. Y'all turned into the Blonde Bombers. Oh. And if you go to the Wikipedia page, when you look up Cow Palace, you know, about the middle of a thing, also that happened at the Cow Palace, uh, professional wrestling with, with Ray Stevens and Pat Patterson, among others, would sell out. <coughs> All the time. Yeah. So tell me about Ray Stevens, because I didn't see enough of his work, but everybody swears by that guy. I swear to God, this kid, this guy was always a 15-year-old. No matter how old he was, he was 15 or 18 years old. He was a party guy. He was a fun guy, you know. If his wife his wife asked him to go get a loaf of bread, he'd come back two days later with the bread. <laughs> <laughs> he was a party guy, I'm telling you. And in the ring, he's, I'll tell you what. He was so good, he could have a match with his eyes closed. And then we're a tag team now. I says, Ray, what are you going to do? You want to start? He says, he just call it. Don't worry. I'll follow. You know, he just didn't worry about anything. He was loved by the boys. There's no question. The guys like to work with him. He was, he was fun to be with. But that's one of the things also just with your relationship with him. You guys are spending so much time together. No matter what it was, he goes, you, you would ask him, Ray, what do you want to do? He goes, whatever you want to do. Whatever Pat. you want. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just easy. No problem. When he's in the ring, even where we're working our ass off, he's laughing in the corner. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> At that point in your career, when you guys are starting to get white hot, yeah. and he's over laughing in the corner, had yeah. you learned that you can have a good time in the ring? Because for, for me, for, for my first five years, I was so dead serious. I didn't think it was like you were allowed to have fun in there. Yeah. And when I was able to have fun, boy, that's when it really blew up. Yeah. Yeah, I learned that from Ray. Yeah, you having fun working—it's unbelievable. The joke that you can do in the ring with the boys—you don't have no idea what we're doing. It's great, you know. We have fun. Hey, let's talk about the Cow Palace a little bit because that building was built in, I think, forty-one, and it was the original home of what is now the Golden State Warriors. So, give or take, that building was twenty-five years old when you get there. When I got there in the nineties. It was a cold, stark building from my memories and kind of wide open. And it was cold because they also played hockey there, so they'd have the cardboard sheets on top of the ice. Oh, it was awful. Sometimes when they set the ring in there. So yeah. it was a brutal place to work, but the fans were hardcore. 
uh, hardcore to the point back in the day, you guys would get so much heat that y'all were afraid for your fucking lives. I'm lucky to be alive. How long from the dressing room to the middle of the ring? Oh, my God. And trying to get out of there if you just cheated to win the championship? Right. Forget it. Yeah, there was riots many times. I mean, many times. One time I thought I was going to die, really. It's crazy. You told And I'm wrestling, I'm wrestling Peter Mavia. He's a god. I mean, he is a real god, you know? Yeah. And that night I pulled a brass knock and I knock at him. Roy Shire, I said, I'm not going to do that. He said, if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. And, Jesus Christ. Boom. Peter is bleeding all over the place. Who do you think comes in the ring? All them Samoans. Afa, Sika, they're killing me. Yeah, yeah. He saved my life, Peter. He really did. I swear to God, these guys. And then Afa, no, Sika was the one really crazy. Like we see the three, four weeks later, I'm wrestling a return match. Sika is way up in the, as far as you can go because he was not allowed to come down. There I am, beating the shit out of Peter Mever. Here he comes. And no one could stop him. <laughs> It was dangerous. Jesus. What was it about? In your book, you you call two people wrestling geniuses. You call uh, Roy Shire and um, Eddie, Eddie, Gra- Eddie, Eddie Graham. Graham down in Florida. Yeah. Uh, now, as you first started off in San Francisco, Roy didn't like you in the beginning. But then you, you all had to, your meeting. He understood. He accepted you. It's the name of the book. You've right. always been accepted. Yeah. And he knew that you would work your ass off and high integrity, go out there and do what you set out to do. So then in, in the later years, he would start asking you your opinion on finishes. And this yeah. is one of, one of the great finish guys in the history of the business. <laughs> How did this help mold your model or your acumen when coming up with a finish? Because now you're getting one of the great minds, and he's asking you. Mm. I know. It's, you know, it's like any. I don't know how you could say that. It, even whether it's, if it's if it's a Vince McMahon, and he's got to make a decision, we should do it this way. We should put that match there. You have to make decision. After a while, you do that day in day out. You ask somebody their opinion. What do you think? You think we should have this match later or earlier? Uh, should we have this match going this way? Because after a while, you you need to. It's no 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 different than a wrestler, you know. He knows what he wants to do in the ring, but I'm not sure. Maybe I should ask somebody. This way, you feel good instead of walking in there. Ah, goddamn it, you know. But that's going back to uh, taking it like you 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 say many times in the book. Wrestlers need to be produced. It's the greatest of the greats. They, yeah. they need feedback. Yeah. And so, so sometimes you know they get such I, maybe so the old saying they get so far in the so far in the woods they can't see the trees, so you know they need to be produced. Like I could be stone cold, but sometimes yeah. you know maybe you would come up to me or Black Jack would say, "Hey, think about this," and I'd be like, "Okay, I'm I'm straight ahead." And here comes this alternative. It's like, "Oh, that's a good idea." Let me broaden my horizon yeah. and, and open up my mind to being able to try that and experiment with that and grow. Yeah. Because if, if you're not produced or don't have any feedback, you know, how do you get better? Yeah. You know, and sometimes also there's too many ideas at one time. Somebody said, well, you, I don't think you should do it this way. Then you bring it back to somebody and say, yeah, I think we should do it the other way. Now you get really confused. There's three, four guys tell you what to do. You're mixed, mixed up. And the same thing with, with when I used to work with with Vince at the office and being creative, you know, when it came down to the came down to the Royal Rumble, Vince said, "Forget about that, Pat. It's not going to work." I said, "Vince, it's got to work." All right, you don't want to, you're going to do it, and I would bring it up, you know, and sometime he'd say, "Okay, we'll we'll, we'll think about it," you know. It, it's you can't do everything, and you need help with somebody, you know. It's like uh, what was the uh, the the one hour they did, a one hour match with Bret Hart and Shawn Michael, he wasn't about to do that. No way, a one hour match on a pay per view. A lot of the guys can't work. It's you know, right, right. one hour. So Vince, you got two kids that can tore the house down. Oh Pat, please forget about it. You know, but eventually it came out. You know, and probably sometimes it takes them to take them a little while to digest. 
Well, let me think about that, you know. You can't have an answer for every question. Maybe you have an answer a little bit later. You have to be patient. You know, it's, it's beautiful. I love it. You know, I like when somebody asks me for my opinion, for an idea, you know. Even if it's just a little thing that looks bad. You know, it's the hardest thing what the guys have is if you're a top guy and there's something that you do in the ring that doesn't look good, who's going to tell you that? Not too many. But I like to do that. I John but I done with Cena many times and John you think of mommy, you die. There was well, there was die. Yeah. You know? There, well, really? Yeah. Okay, if you want to do it fine, you know. There was someone in the book, I think they were fixing to leave into another territory, and I think it was your kicks in the turnbuckle that weren't looking so yeah. great. No, and, no, you were telling this to somebody else. It was Hogan. Was it? Oh, good, yeah. Yeah, you you told maybe someone told you earlier in your career. But I was this. I was in Montreal. I was yes. not in Montreal. I was in Florida, and he was in Montreal. I think he was in Montreal, and he was working with somebody. But anyway, I called him, and he answered. And I said, "Terry, you all set? Yeah, I'll be all right." I says, "Remember now, you don't have to go crazy." I says, "Just do what you do and do it well. That's all you have to do. You're Ogan." Okay, brother. Then apparently, I, you put the phone down. He said, motherfucker, he said, that son of a bitch is great. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just a little touch that he yeah. needed, you know. Hey, uh, towards the end of your run in San Francisco, uh, you were kind of, you weren't office, but you damn near were office and working for Roy Shire. Right. Uh, he couldn't make a battle roll one time. Oh, he had a battle roll every year. Yeah. Yeah. And every. maybe, was, was the Royal Rumble born from... Maybe because uh, the way you invented it <laughs> yeah. was different than Roy Shires, but were the seeds planted in those early battle royals working in big time wrestling? They were just uh, in those days. It was just a regular battle royal. Right. Twenty guys, you're number two, number three, right. and that's it. It was not one after the other. You all go in, ding ding. It was just a battle royal. But I always wanted. I have some stories from old timers that I heard. Okay, a battle royal. Somebody came up with that somehow. No one knew. I have no idea. Nobody knows who invented the battle royal. You're right. I don't either. I don't know. So I kept saying, I'd like to create a battle royal. And when I came up with the idea, you know, one guy and two guy, you know, I are you fucking crazy? Come on. You know, I said, he thought it was a shit. He hated it. And then y'all go do the Saturday night special or whatever it was. Tell yeah. Him, Dick Ebersol, you know. Ebersol. Yeah. And, he, you know, we, we, can, we have to give him the card. Hogan's going to sign a contract. And a tag team championship match. And, and Dick Ebersol says, well, it's a good card. It's on USA Network, you know. No, Network, but USA Network. Yeah. He says, ah, it's not really all. Something is missing. And Vince says, why don't you tell him that stupid idea? <laughs> And I gave him the concept. I didn't have a name. I for know, it. but you said it first of all. It's not stupid. I think it's great. That's and right. Dick ever saw this. It's a stupid it, idea. Loved it. Yeah. <laughs> he said, "Pat, tell him it's a stupid idea." I said, first of all, it's not a stupid idea." I give him the, the how it's going to work. I didn't have a name for it. He says, "Oh my God, this is legal running." That sounded good. Yeah. Well, and Vince says, "Ah, oh, we'll think about it. You know, think about it." But we did it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because uh, there was no name for the match. It needed no, it. something it was... spectacular to call it. So, like, like 50 people from the office, or they submitted yeah. 50 ideas, and yeah. uh, Royal Rumble was one yeah. of them. Exactly. And so it became known as the Royal Rumble. Exactly. And turned yeah. into a pay-per-view event. Yeah. So you finish up with Roy Shire, and it's time to go somewhere else. And that ends up being to Florida with Eddie Graham. And, man, I know you got stories about working down there and what you learned from Eddie Graham. But before we start in on Florida, let me give a big ups to Onnit. Onnit makes Alpha Brain. And Alpha Brain gave me the focus I needed to finish Pat Patterson's new book, Accepted, in time for this interview. I love that book. That's what Alpha Brain does. Keeps me razor sharp and laser focused. Helps my memory and my retention. So thanks to Onnit, the fine folks who make Alpha Brain. And if you go to Onnit.com slash Steve to get some Alpha Brain for yourself, you can save 10% off your order. You can save 10% off anything you order at Onnit.com slash Steve. So, yes. 
You can get 10% off Shroom Tech Sport. Shroom Tech Sport will give you workout a boost. Helps you go longer and recover faster. And yes, you can get 10% off T-Plus. T-Plus increases strength and power. It'll improve your athletic performance. And it's safe to use if you're competing. So go take advantage of this 10% discount off your order. Just go to onnit.com slash Steve. And another great thing about Onnit and all their products is, if they don't work the way they're supposed to, you can get all your money back, no questions asked. Money back guarantee. So go to onnit.com slash Steve to get your 10% discount off all supplements. That's O-N-N-I-T dot com slash Steve to get 10% off your order. So you end up finishing up with Roy Shire, and it's time to go somewhere else. You went down to Florida. You worked for uh, wrestling genius Eddie Graham. And Johnny Valentine, yeah. I think, had the book. Yeah. You and Johnny weren't on the same page. No, not at all. But what about Eddie? I always heard that this guy was a genius in the business. What made this guy so smart? Well, he had the great psychology of the business, and he a lot of these guys that worked down there, and they learned the business from Eddie. But Eddie was just like really like the old school. You know what I mean? It was not like the ha ha and everything else. It was just the old school, you know, just right. work a hole and work a hole, and blah, 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 you know what I mean? It was not all the flying and that we, like we do today. He was very good. He had very good ideas. And I heard years ago, Roy Shire, uh, Eddie Graham, there was another promoter. They always talked to each other. D- Funk, Dory Funk, yeah. They always talked to each other, you know. Get any ideas and blah, 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 you know what I mean? So in Florida, I had a blast there. Dusty Road there, the Briscoes. Oh, I had a great time with it. But you didn't stay there very long. No, a couple of years. I was I was a booker for about six months. Not for me. No? No. How no. did the first booking session go? Huh? Why, what, what was the problem with it? Well, there's a lot of local guys there, you know, the, the Briscoes and me. And blah, blah. I was not the booker, I'm sorry. The assistant booker with Valentine. He was, I'm going to clean up house. I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to... Tired of all these guys. I said to myself, that's not going to work. It didn't, you know, because you wanted to change everything. And, and Valentine is a slow, uh, maybe, don't know. Didn't work. But what about him as a heel in the ring? He'd grab a hole and you you just sit in it and wait. Wait till he gets off of it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> okay, so, so you're, there, you're there for a while, and then you put a phone call into Vern to work for the uh, AWA in, in Minnesota. That was Ray. Ray trying to bring me up. Right. Yeah. So you, uh, how, how was Vern? Well, wasn't that funny? I've worked in San Francisco for years, had a big name and everything else. And Vern Gagne says, well, you got blonde hair. I said, yeah. He says, well, well, you have... Two guys with blonde hair over here. You're going to have to have a different color. I said, well, I ain't going. I ain't changing my color. And a week later, he said, all right. You know, so now the Ray was, knew I was coming, and, and I had a blast in Minneapolis. Louie was there, too. What was the style in the ring in AWA all the way up there in Minneapolis? Was it different than the places that you had been from Montreal, Boston? Portland, Basically the same. Portland, same. Then, now, wait a minute. You know, in those days, it was Vern Gagne. The bruiser, the crusher, these were the guys, you know what I mean? And so there was a lot of wrestling, uh, lots of wrestling. They liked a lot of wrestling. Vern liked him get behind, go in the bank. You know, there was not that many flying, you know. Right. Uh, in, in your uh, in your career, I always think you uh, you took chances. You know, I mean, it was it was a chance coming from Montreal down to Boston, yeah, and then from Boston all the way across the globe, like uh, the promoter, yeah, uh, told you. And then Vashon had written you a letter. You didn't yeah. go the first time, but you went the second time. And so you are you are always willing to take a gamble. You are always willing to take a risk. You are always I willing had to, to push. Him. You had to, yeah. and you did. But uh, after your time in the uh, AWA, you requested a meeting with Vern Gagne because. As laid back as Ray Stevens was, you wanted to know what a promoter's plans for you were because right. you were thinking in the here and you were thinking in the future. Yeah. And so Vern tells you, he goes, I don't tell my secrets. And, you know, since Ray went with the flow, you needed to know. You you said... Uh, I don't tell my secret. Yep. And uh, he said uh, he wouldn't tell you. And you said, fine, I won't tell you my secrets. That's right. But the secret <laughs> was... 
New York. <laughs> you had a secret ace in the sleeve with Vince Sr. Yeah. How did that transpire? Great. He, Mike LaBelle was a promoter in Los Angeles, and they were friends and everything else. And Mike LaBelle calls me. He said, Vince wants you in New York. I said, me going to New York? Give me a break, for Christ's sake. I never dreamed of that. And I knew that the thing with Ray and I in Minneapolis is... We had enough, you know what I mean? So I told Rhea, I said, I have a chance to go to New York. He said, go, goddamn go. I said, well, that's what I told Vern. You have any plans for us? I don't tell my plans. I said, so, I got plans too, but I ain't going to tell you either. See, I got to know. I said, no, you tell me yours. And I told him, I says, I'm going to New York. That's it. So Vince's plan, Vince Sr.'s plan, he wanted you, was, was it right out of the gate? He wanted to work for back to back to back to back shots in Madison Square Garden with Bob Backlund as champion? Yeah, well, he brought me to New to work with Backlund, but back to back, I don't think he was sure. He didn't know. Oh. I mean, if the first one is no good, you ain't going to go with the second one. Right. Because in New York, you got to sell out or you got to have a crowd. First match I worked with Backlund, it was like, the old man, he was so happy. Then go to another one. Then go to another one. Then go I went to four with Backlund. That's unheard of. It was not un- it was not a picnic. <laughs> it was not a picnic. <laughs> what are you saying, Pat? Yeah. Right, here, here's the thing. Let me what were you thinking uh because you're a creative guy and <laughs> you, you you like to you know, you take bumps, you like to really get your baby face over. Bob's a farmer shooter. Yeah. What was the chemistry in the ring? Did he understand what you wanted to do or your vision? He was told, when I tell you, do it, that's it. He had to listen to every word I say. I had it made, because Vince says, listen to Pat. But he had the mentality, you know, shooting. Right. He was always afraid that somebody's going to double cross him. He wrestled with some big guys, right. you know what I mean? I swear to you, in the, in the cage match, he swore that I was going to double cross him. I asked him. He was pulling on me. And God, I'm over the cage. And I'm pulling it. I asked him. I said, but you fucking shooting with me or what? He says, well, I, I don't know. I, I, I thought you were trying to. Yeah. That's interesting to know that mindset, <laughs> just because I can understand back in those days. I mean, because fast forward a couple of years, I mean, because the Montreal screw job would happen. Yeah. We'll, we'll get that in a minute. But I can see where that paranoia would come from. I know. Well, one guy left out, I'd like to take it back just to when uh, I, I must have been Portland. I think you were working with the legendary Pat O'Connor, who was at the yeah. time the National Wrestling Alliance I world love champion. Pat O'Connor, yeah. I know you're a big idol, yeah. but when you guys, I mean, he was a big, you were a big fan of his, but when you guys went out there, the matches weren't so much. And because he was the legendary Pat O'Connor, mm-hmm. you trepidatiously said, Pat. May I have a conversation with you, and you won't get mad at me? Right. <laughs> he said yes, and so you said, "Just, just, do you mind if I lead the match?" He goes, "We'll, we'll tear the place down. Right. We'll just let me do my thing." Yeah. And let me think about it. He <laughs> thought about it, and then you went out and tore the house. Oh down my god! And I loved it. Yeah. yeah. So what I was it about it. Pat O'Connor? Because I never got a chance to see a lot of film on that guy. Well, he's, you know, dingy gang, bang, 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 roll around. Okay, yeah. okay kid, what are you going to do now? I go, God damn. But I see, when I watched him work before, and I said, Jesus, I'd like to work with him. And then after that match that we had, he was at the bar. And he was a guy that, the tightest guy in the business, yeah. believe me. And uh, I said, I'd like to buy you a beer, okay? He says, no, no, I'll buy you the beer. Almost had a heart attack for Christ's sake. <laughs> yeah, it was nice, you know. Hey, what was the deal with the uh, when they uh, in in '79 when you were crowned the first Intercontinental Champion? Because yeah. I was at one time the Intercontinental Champion. <laughs> I got dropped on my head defending that belt, and that belt, <clears throat> that one, that that original belt that was there for a while, through a lot of badass hands, is in my safe. You were the first IC champion, <laughs> yeah. but you were never in where was it Rio? Gener- where was it in? Uh, it was in, a, yeah, Rio de Janeiro. In Rio you're de Janeiro. You're not really in Rio de Janeiro, but you're the IT champion. Don't ask me what date and what day. 
And, and you know, it's it's only fitting that that belt would would start off with a hellacious worker because some of the best workers in the history of the business, at times that IC belt was the belt to go see. That's because true. I never thought of it that way. If you know, you it's true. Champion, yeah, right, you're right. Yeah, I mean, so a lot of times, uh, yeah. you know, the world champion was the world champion, but that the workers were the ones carrying that IC strap, and I was just so coveted to me, and you were the first one. Oh God! Another thing that, but I gotta say it. It's Sergeant Slaughter, the alley fight. I had oh, dude, in 1981. we got to talk about that. That. I watched I mean, that match three times the other day. <laughs> Jesus. You're kidding. Was, was he selling or what? Oh, my God. Huh? But just the magic that happened on the turnbuckle oh. when he, he got, gets, yeah. the, uh, gets the, the job done oh. in action, oh. not on a mat, while he's flying, hits one, and he's just – Busted wide open. Oh, my God. And he's falling down on the one knee, and he wants to fight. And He was so good. But both of you guys were selling in such epic fashion. And that's if the not, difference. That's the difference. Selling. I know you're here now today, and you still work with WWE hands-on. You file reports about what you see. You still talk to the superstars. You talk to me. You took the rock under your wing. You've mentored so many guys in the <laughs> business. Now when you think, Pat, are we selling too little now? Has the business gotten so fast that we can't slow down a little bit? Where are we? Well, they're going too fast. Yeah. Yeah. It's my opinion, yeah. I think so too. There's a certain style, you know, they ba bing, ba boom, ba bum, okay, fine. But the top guys, they, they got to slow down for me. And, you know, that being said, I want to go, go, what you got? Okay. I was just like, uh, well, go ahead, I'll get to that. And about selling. Yeah, well, I want to talk to you. How about did Shawn Michael get over? Yeah. Telling. How did Bret Hart get over? Telling. And how is. Dolph Ziggler telling he wrestles a little bastard. Right. He does. He wrestles. He's nothing. Ying, 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 ying. He, saw, he sells. Sean would fucking crawl and bang. You know what I mean? And Dolph is the same way. He tells a story. But it goes back to the, the to the quote about Ray Shire. No matter how good you were in the ring, he didn't care about your moves. Exactly. All that mattered was the psychology. He didn't care if you did something spectacular. He cared if it meant something. So, Pat, the yeah. guy can go out there and do a bunch of whirly gig flips and flops and eh. Yeah. But if it doesn't mean anything at its core essence, yeah. then what are you doing? Yeah. What, was it to be effective? You know, or are you just showing off? Yeah. So it has to mean something. Yeah. So sometimes I, I think, and I'm not going to nitpick, turn this to a, a nitpicking no, no, right. session on today's business because I'm 51 and I've been out forever. You're 75 and right. you're working with these guys, so I'm not yeah. trying to offend anybody. But, you know, when I look back at, uh, you know, my move set, it was, it was very basic. It, even The Rock's move set was very basic. Uh, but he's very athletic. Yeah. But, I mean, he would sell like crazy, but it wasn't about a big presence. Well, his presence was larger than life, but it wasn't like he was doing a million things. What he did and how he got over as a uh, as a performer and people loved him fueled and, and when it, it, their love for him. And when, when someone got heat on him, you remember the buildings. Yeah. Oh, are you kidding me? Rocky. Rocky yeah. and the blue, the, the roof would blow off the place. Yeah. yeah. So, but but it's selling. Okay. What is your take? Uh, and I asked uh, Ricky Morton this the other day on getting over. One of his things was right place, right time. Right place, right time. But you. I don't really believe that. Okay. W what what do you believe? You're there. If it doesn't work, you go someplace else. But uh, I think you go there, and right. Uh, the wrong place, not the right, the right time, I think it just, maybe you don't give it a chance. Man, to me. I don't know. I'm just saying. I, I, getting, I, I worked at the promoter, and after six months, if I don't make any money, I just leave. I just I can't say wrong time, right place. I don't know. It's a, maybe a different Well, I, I, think, I think it's more of a thing where if, if the circumstances are right, because, I mean, you with all the talent that you had uh, through coming up all the lessons that you learned in your, in your peak at San Fran or when you went to New York, if you didn't have it all together and have some presence and charisma. Oh, but, but maybe I, that's what it is then. Instead of saying wrong time, wrong, time, right, wrong place, 
maybe they didn't have it. Right. It seems you somebody has it. Though. But you, 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 yeah. You know what I'm you, But you say. have to have it. You have to have it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If you're in a territory for six months and they're not doing anything with you because you got something they don't like. But also, it might not be because you haven't evolved to what's going to get you over, because then I would take you, case in point, and I'm not trying to make this about me, but when I came here as the ringmaster, yeah. I'd been working seven and a half years at Stunning Steve. Right. Yeah, they, the, I, you know, I had the, the TV belt, tag right. belt. There were plenty of opportunities. Right. But I was, over, oh, oh, I was only over at a certain level. Ringmaster, hey, fuck that. Shave the head, grow the goatee. Stone Cold Steve Austin, all the pieces of the puzzle were together then, and I knew how to work, yeah. and I was pissed off, and I was able to then maybe capture people. So then I think, Pat, it's, it's the ability uh, of you as a baby or a heel to capture people, whether it's love or hate, trying right. to be a baby face or heel, whatever the case may right. be, but it's resonating or re establishing a, a relationship or rapport with the people. Right? Yeah, that has a lot to do. And you know, like you go to some place and you're there six months. It may be I didn't click on this. I didn't click or they had too many baby faces, they had too many heels, I'll go someplace else. You don't know, but I, that phrase that they say, the wrong time, wrong place, I don't know. But you got over wherever you went. Yeah, for some reason, I don't know why. Right. <laughs> but you were also accepted wherever you went. I accept it, but I'm, I'm talking about working also, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like only one place is Arizona. <laughs> I screwed up with the, I screwed the promoter, you know. What happened in the Arizona story? Uh, it was a small territory then, and, and I worked there, and it was the promoter. He didn't know the business, but he, he had a little territory around Arizona. So the name of the building, it's a, you work there, and you're on, on Saturday night, a small building called Madison Square Garden. I think it was 200, 300 people. It was packed. And you got maybe 100 bucks for that night. That made your week, you know, the little towns. But he was such a piece of shit, honest to God. He treated the boys bad and everything else. So I held him up. I had the belt. And that says, I'm leaving. So, yeah, you got the belt. I said, it's mine. I said, you want the belt? You're going to have to pay me. You know, I held him up. So the guy that I was work with before I left, you know, he's in the ring, and I got, I says, give me the money, 550 bucks, give me, I'll give it to you after the match. No, 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 you give it to me. Now, I put up my tights and went in the ring. <laughs> he told me, I have a hell of a match. I told my opponent, as soon as we hook, one, two, three, that's it, one, two, three, belt that guy. <laughs> And Louis was outside with the car, <laughs> jumping the car. The clothes were all there, gone. Boom. Uh, when, you're, when you're working with uh, Vince McMahon Sr., what was the difference uh, between him and Junior when he would come in and take over? Because if I remember in the book, right before Vince Sr. passed away, yeah. you went to his bedside, and he said, and he asked you to help out. Oh, but no, what happened is that he was when he was sick. Yeah. Okay. Vince was in the office, and I was on the road, you know, like like Jack Lanza was, or me, or whatever. Yeah. But the old man would say, uh, "You're gonna Hogan. I mean, Hogan's gonna be there, and yeah. Andre, you know, and make sure you take care of Andre. He always loved to take care of Andre, you know. So, yes, yes, um, Vince, don't worry, we will, you know. Okay, you know, and it broke my heart because he was dying, you know what I mean. So we had to batter well. I'll never forget that, the Battle Royal with Andre and Ogan. Vince was asking me, he said, what are we going to book there? First night in St. Louis. What are we going to book? I said, well, I don't know. Who's Ogan going to work with? I don't know. I said, Pat, we got to come up with something. I said, well, what about the Battle Royal? We'll have a trophy. Yeah, okay, Battle Royal. Yeah. <laughs> that was our first show in St. Louis. What was uh, Vince Sr.'s uh, vision as a promoter versus Vince Jr.? Oh, he doesn't have the same visions as Junior, no. Vince Sr. had the Northeast, and he had the stars there, so he was happy with that. That's all he wanted. Boston, Philadelphia, yeah. New York, I mean, God, come on. Yeah, it's all great. big towns, and all, you know, all he had TV and everywhere, but Junior wanted to, he wanted to 
want to go to the moon. So what did you think when Junior took over? Because a lot of the boys are rumbling backstage. Hey, man, <laughs> oh, they this were. kid's going to f- blow this for everybody. Believe me, they were. You know, funny, and that kid's going to ruin it. You know, they, oh, my God. All these guys, the Italian guys, they were in Boston for years, the local guy. He's going to kill the business. And oh, God almighty. And the funny thing how it happened, he ordered uh, a booker, George Scott. That didn't last. Hogan didn't like George Scott, and, uh, and Hogan was in then, Bobby Heenan was in, everybody hated George Scott, I don't know why, but they did. But anyways, I'm on the road, and uh, I'm in, I'm in uh, Toronto, Vince, uh, we announced the next card for the next month, he said, I don't know, I'll call you back. And I went later, Vince, you got the card, I know what to do. God damn it, all right, do it. he told me what to do. I said, Vince. I said, it seemed to me like you're having the problem. He says, what do you mean? I says, huh, you know, you're behind all the booking and everything. He says, what the hell do you want me to do? I'm all by myself. I said, Vince, I got a week off. If you want it, I'll go help you and then put you a week or three weeks in advance. He said, shit, no one's ever offered me that. <laughs> so I go to the office. I'm in the basement smoking a cigarette. He's in his office, and I'm booking some of these matches, this town and that town, boom, boom. He comes down later on, he goes, oh, my God, you got three, four weeks already, you know, and he's checking, maybe we'll erase that and all that. Still smoking. It's been there ever since. You had a secretary. And you, he, he came down one time, and you were filing some of your reports and stuff in a, in a filing cabinet. And he says, what are you doing? He goes, I'm filing stuff. He goes, that's what you got a secretary for. You didn't. Oh, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. you're supposed to use the secretary to help you do do your I work. Know. Yeah. I didn't know. You're afraid to ask her to do anything. Yeah, well, I'm just doing everything <laughs> myself. I, I know. He, that's true. That's true. I don't forget that. And when uh, he asked me to work in the office after that, then I wasn't too crazy about it. Because now I'm going to be working in the office. And he takes me out with Linda, so sit down, have a nice dinner. Patrick, as of tonight, you're a senior vice president. What does that mean? I have no idea. No idea what to right. see your vice president. Oh, you, you know, you, Vince, you're going to give me a title, and when you're tired, you're going to take it away from me, right? I didn't know what it was. Yeah, yeah. So I worked in the office for a while. I had a blast in the office. It was fun. It was a, it was a, new, a new thing to do, and I played a lot of ribs there. In the office? Oh, God, yes. What kind of ribs in the office? Well, okay. Um, there was an old man that would come in the office from one floor to the other, every two weeks, and he would sit in the hallway in a little boot, and he would shine shoes. He would knock on the office, he'd shoes. He had five pairs at the time, and he shines them. Then he keeps on moving, you know. He makes a living like this. It could, yeah, I'm sitting in my office. I'm looking at that little box there. God damn it. I take that box. What do you think I do? I go and hide it in the ladies' room. But this guy's coming back with his shoes, and he's freaking out. I mean, he is actually freaking out. I can't believe that somebody stole my box. That's how I make my living. I can't believe it. All the secretaries are outside. They think he's having a heart attack. It's, it's, it's emotion now. It's crazy. I said, what the hell did I do? <laughs> I'm in my office. My phone rings. He says, Vince, Patrick, did you have anything to do with that? I said, yes. He says, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, some guys would come in the office, and they would do ceiling here. And now they put the ladder up. They gotta put this thing apart and everything else. And they're there for twenty minutes, and they come down to disappear. What the hell? Been gone for a long time. No problem. Take the ladder and go to hide it somewhere. <laughs> they come back. They can't find the ladder. <laughs> All kinds of things like that. I would put some uh, some little no. What do you call it? A little card out of order on each elevator. <laughs> One morning, I get there early. I get there early. So I'm up. Around 7 o'clock, people started to arrive at the office. Everybody had to walk up the stairs, including Vince and Linda. <laughs> it was out of order. <laughs> All I had to do was push a button. That's it. <laughs> Hey, I think I know someone else who's been on the receiving end of one of your ribs. 
Diamond Dallas Page. But that's another story for another day. The Diamond Dallas Page story I want to tell right now is about his DDP Yoga and the new DDP Yoga Now app. Y'all know that DDP Yoga has changed thousands of lives, including the lives of some of your favorite pro wrestlers. Jake the Snake, Scott Hall, Mick Foley, AJ Styles, and Chris Jericho. They all swear by DDP Yoga. And now DDP has taken his life-changing program to a whole nother level with the DDP Yoga Now app, which you can get for both iOS and Android devices. So now you ain't got no more excuses about why you can't start DDP Yoga. That means you can do it anytime, anywhere. And the cool thing about the app is you can track more than just DDP Yoga workouts. By connecting to a Bluetooth heart rate monitor, you can track your calories and heart rate in real time. You can track your pain, measurements, progress photos, too, all for free in the app. You've got tons of workouts to choose from, the original DDP Yoga workouts, the new 2.0 workouts, and weekly live workouts from the DDP Yoga Performance Center. And DDP hosts a gluten-free, dairy-free cooking show with all kinds of surprise guests. So get your workout on. Get your healthy cooking on and get on the DDP Yoga program using the DDP Yoga Now app. And to make it even easier than he's already made it, for a limited time, you can get the DDP Yoga DVDs for 20% off, plus three months of full access to the DDP Yoga Now app. Just go to ddpyoga.com slash Austin. That's ddpyoga.com slash Austin to take advantage of this great deal. Commit now. Change your life. Go to ddpyoga.com slash Austin to get started. If you're looking to buy a new or used car, then you need to check out TrueCar.com and the TrueCar app. I bet you didn't know that you can use TrueCar to help you buy a used car, too. It ain't just for new car purchases. There are over 500,000 pre-owned vehicles available from TrueCar certified dealers nationwide. And there are over 11,000 TrueCar certified dealers. And TrueCar lets you get upfront pricing information on new and used vehicles and lets you see what other people paid for the car you want so that you feel confident you're getting a fair price. With TrueCar, via their TrueCar pricing curve, you see what other people paid for the car and you lock in your guaranteed savings. Then you can connect with the local certified dealer of your choosing, take them your TrueCar guaranteed savings certificate, and make your car buying experience quick and easy. Over 2 million cars have been sold to True Car users by the True Car Certified Dealer Network. And True Car users save an average of over $3,000 off MSRP. So when you're ready to buy a new or used car, visit TrueCar.com or download the True Car app to enjoy a better car buying experience. Some features not available in all states. Hey, uh, let's, let's fast forward. Uh, Montreal screw job. You yeah. maintain in the book you had nothing to do with it. Absolutely. Straight up shoot. Oh, yeah. Shoot. <laughs> if, if I had, I would have said I had no choice to be part of it. I did not know. Steve, let me tell you, I was watching the match because I always liked it. And I, I mean, there's a curtain. Owen is there. And what's his name? The David Boy. There. Well, I don't know. Watching the match and all of a sudden, holy shit. And they go, what the hell is this? I had no idea. Now I'm freaking out. And I look at Gorilla. Before there was, Gorilla, there was a lot of people there. Yeah. And there was not the many that there. Now they, some people knew, but I didn't know. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm freaked out, honest to God. I didn't even go see Vince. So I took my suitcase, my briefcase. I went downstairs in the parking lot. And I'm fucking quitting. I got in the car, and I went to the hotel across the street, have a few drinks, and uh, that's it. I'm quitting. I just, I was shocked, honest to God. Now I'm drinking, and I'm drinking, and I'm there about a half an hour, 40 minutes. Then I start thinking, I look like I'm running away. You know, I look like I'm fucking, I'm afraid. I got to go back. I get in the car. I go all the way upstairs. By that time, it's about a half an hour, 45 minutes later. Where's Brett? He's in his room, so I stopped walking. Somebody said to me, don't go in there now. There's going to be trouble. I said, I'm going. They said, Vince was there earlier. I said, I don't care. I'm going to go talk to Brett. And I knocked on the door. Who was that? It was Pat Patterson. They opened the door, and I went to Brett. He was sitting down. I said, Brett, got them. I had nothing to do with it. If you believe me, shake my hands. If you don't, you know how much I fucking help you over the years. I didn't know. I did not know. And he wouldn't shake my hands. And I left. And the next day we were in Ottawa. Oh, my God. I was, 
I was, even the boys were a little upside down. Well, it was down, strange because you know? I hadn't been in a company real night. long. Huh? I thought, man, when, it, when Brett got screwed and he, then he was going to go down to WCW, and I was just thinking, what are we going to do about the one and only Bret Hart? You know, Bret Hart was a big part of my career. Right. Man, I love that guy. Yeah. So I'm, I'm like, what are we going to do without Bret? Yeah. Because I just thought that much of him. Yeah. And, of course, you know, everything transpired and everything ended up okay, but there was a lot of bad blood oh. there forever. Finally, yeah. finally, you were able to break through and make peace with Bret, right? It took a long time. Yes, many years. Two or three years, I think. Yeah. What would you have thought had you been in his boots that night? I don't know. I mean, that's ultimate betrayal, right? But I mean, but by not wanting to do business, I mean, it, the promoter has to do oh, what yeah. the promoter has to do. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, you know, you say this in the, in the book many times, Pat. Um, this is sports entertainment. Yeah. Uh, so everybody knows that. Yeah. But to us, it's real. Yeah. And so Brett was so real about that and his fan base in Canada yeah. that he had made up his mind that he could not drop the belt there right. anywhere else. But not I thought there. that was wrong on his part, big time, big time. So what do you do? Vince had to do what he has to do. Right. I don't blame Vince. No, after, after you know, at first you go, what the hell did he do that for? Oh, my God. After a while you digest it and you know the reason why he had to do it. Right. You know? But I didn't know. <laughs> the funniest thing is that in the afternoon they're sitting down together, you know, and I'm there, and sit down with them, blah blah blah, and when they're talking, they walk away. And now I know why they were talking because I think I think Sean knew it, but I didn't. So they're all getting along. That was Vince. How are they doing? Doing great. Back. They're talking, talking. Spot. Great. Okay. I had no nothing. As good as the Iron Man match was in 60 minutes, I think they added a few minutes to it. Uh, there was there was never any love lost between those guys. They, I, I don't think at that time there was. Th well, I think they were so competitive. Yeah. I think uh, they, they weren't mad at each other, but I just think they were, they were so competitive that that was an awesome match. But then after that, you know, the, the screw job, I think I think that there was a divide, but I guess in the video that they did, and the DVD, I guess, now that they've come full circle. Pat, in all your travels on the road, all the ribs you played, all the bullshit shenanigans, you you never got into drugs. No. You love to drink. Yeah, you like your oh, vodka. Yeah, drink, and yeah. we've had a few drinks together, and I, I yeah. certainly love my vodka, my whiskey, and my beer. That's it. How was it with trying to, when you first started being uh, in, in the position that Vince hired you in, uh, because this was before everybody had cell phones, and yeah. trying to get finishes to guys, and guys would not turn up. We take for granted, or the business today takes for granted, or relies upon modern technology. Yeah. But back in the days, it was, and you guys were running four shots a night. Oh, it's crazy. And so you were the guy that everybody was calling. <laughs> so what could have been a dream job was a fucking nightmare, wasn't it? It was. Believe me, it was crazy. Because Vincent was trying all new things. He was growing, and oh, Pat, you're going to take care of this town. Oh, you have no idea. So many stories. So many stories. What happened in 2006 when you were in Montreal? You were visiting, and you were having some pain. Yeah. And this would lead to your aortic yeah. aneurysm? Yeah. Describe that to me. Well, I was playing golf. And I had my sister with me in downtown Montreal, and my back was killing me. And I thought, God damn it, I thought it was golf. And I go outside, and I stretch, I'm on the sidewalk, and hang. It was a pain in the back. It really was. So since I was not living in Montreal that much, my sister took me to Laval and to a clinic. A clinic at... Uh, Four o'clock in the morning. But she made you go, didn't she? Oh, she came with me. Yeah, because you just you're trying to no-sell it. Yeah, I thought, I, mean, I got to go. She says, we're going to go to the clinic right now. They took an x-ray. said, this is very serious. I said, what do you mean it's serious? It's very serious. And you're going to go to the hospital right next block. You got to go there. I'm going to send this. I said, come on, doc. Said, no, no, it's, it's serious. Go there. And I went. And I waited for about half an hour. There was a specialist there in no time. 
And when they brought me in on a stretcher right away, right away, I said, wait a minute, Doc, wait, let me know what's going on. He said, sir, it's very dangerous. They put me in the scanner twice. He said, we operate on you now. I said, Doc, how bad is it? You have 10% chance of surviving the surgery. And if things goes well, there's a chance that you could be crippled from the waist down. Well, I said, that's nice, Doc. So I gave my rein to my wife, to my sister. They wheeled me in, and I woke up about seven days later. Very lucky. But the thing started off uh, um, like a normal or maybe a, a large aneurysm would be like five millimeters or centimeters and yours was like triple mine was 11 yeah double and that, that doctor that specialist he says i can't believe you're alive he says, i can't believe you're alive even my own doctor they issued the report pat you're the luckiest guy in the world you are the luckiest guy in the world you had a great life <laughs> i did i did what made you finally decide to write the book vince are you kidding me? I've no. been trying to convince him to write a book for years because of everything that he's done. Oh, him. It would be, it would be, it would be amazing. Yeah. So w w why did it take so long for you to do this? You know why I think, since I've been around Vince for uh, many years and traveling together, and, and Vince got to know me well, and he knows my life, he knew Louie, you know what I mean? And we always get along business-wise and everything, and, and Vince looked at me, you know, to him, he thinks like, Pat, you worked your ass off, you helped so much, you did so much, and he goes, Pat, your story is a great story to write. I said, Vince, I don't need to write a book. I said, Pat, what you went through, you know. I said, I don't know, maybe I will or not, and that's how he got me into that. Vince, Was it cathartic for you? Like what? Was it a... Uh a load off your back, to just, just or was it enlightening for you? It was a, a release. It was a question. I said, "Well, Emily, should I write a book? I would not want to write a book to make money. I, that would not be the reason. But then I would forget about it. You know, I'd go maybe six yeah. months or a year later. Patrick, when are you going to write the book? You know. Then I started thinking and started thinking, and then what helped me is when we did the Legends House. This is where that started. I said, God damn, I had enough. Or, you know, I can say, I know the guys that were with me at the table, they knew I was gay. Right. But I never said it to everybody. I am whatever you want to right. say. It felt good to say it. You know what I'm saying? It felt good to be me now, you know. And after that, I said, now I got to write the book. When you did that on uh, Legends House, when you like officially <coughs> came out, because yeah. some people suspected, yeah. some people knew, right. but you had never said it. Or no. if someone asked you, you'd give them the tough guy routine, hey, what the fuck are you talking about, or whatever, as you've said in a book. Right, yeah. So and, and on Legends House, did that just finally free you up it's like hey it did everybody it's, knows now god yeah. damn it i ain't gotta hide nothing this is me yeah this is who i am if you yeah. don't like it this is the way it is but this is me yeah but you know what steve looking back years ago you know you go to the territory and you go to the bar after that what do you see rats well, i shouldn't call them that but Women. they're there okay yeah. and the guys can have their pick okay and they go to a party and they have a good time, no problem. And a lot of times, some of these guys would say, Pat, I'm going to call my wife. I'm going to say hello. She knows that you're with me. There's no problem. Nah, we'll just have a couple of beers. Oh, uh, you're okay with Pat. But as soon as the phone is up, they're going up and staring with a girl, right. right? It's okay. So that happened every night, which is okay with me. Could I go somewhere in a gay bar? No. Pat Patterson was seen in the gay bar. Oh, my God. No, I could not. You know what I mean? So it sucked. <laughs> you know? Where they you? could have all their fun. I couldn't. No kidding. No. I, I didn't want to be known in the like Pat Patterson. He was in the gay bar the other night. You know? Oh, my God. Even if you just go to a bar, take a, take a, have a beer, and hit somebody, hey, I'm a gay guy, wrestler. Oh, oh, I, couldn't, I could not live my life the way I wanted to. How frustrating was that? 
Well, you get used to it after a while, but you're still thinking about it. Right. Yeah. Like in Montreal, or anywhere now. In Montreal, I go to the bars, I go to the karaoke bars, the gay ones. I don't give a damn. Had you come out, in speculation or in hindsight, had you came out, maybe your peak years were in big-time wrestling You're right. with Ray Stevens. Yeah. What if you went to Roy Shire and said, hey, man, at the Cow Palace, I'd like to announce that I'm gay? Oh, God, no. That have been a, it, would, it would have killed the territory, right? Uh, not so much kill it. I don't mean... No, I, I just I'd mean, be gone. You'd be gone. Yeah. You, because you, yeah. you couldn't do that then. Right. And so, but to have that, to, to like you said, to kayfabe the business, to kayfabe your personal life, yeah. all the years oh, that, that, that you did. I mean, yeah. and the business is one thing because we love it and respect it, but yeah. the personal thing... It's you, and yeah. that's twenty four seven. There's no, you can't get away from that because in many stories, I mean, you you're like Nick Bockwinkle, um, I, f- I forget the other guy, Pepper y'all, Martin, all these guys. All yeah. you, y'all, yeah. love, y'all love to talk about everything but the business, right? So you can get away with the business, but still right. be with the boys, right? But you can never get away from the fact because you were hiding your secret, yeah, and could never ever be totally free, yeah. It was, a, it was a hard thing to do, and I'm glad I did it, Steve. But you wanted to do it to help Well, kids. I wanted to do it before and, I die, for Christ's sake. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and to set the record straight or for no one to be, uh, no rumors, of, hey, this is this patent. You, you own it. Yeah. And, and th- there's nothing wrong with owning it. It's just who you are. Yeah. And so, fuck. And you know what bothers me? Because uh, I have used to read stories about where the, some of the kids... Kids, 15, 14 years old, they get thrown out of the house by their parents because they're gay. I mean, it's sad, you know. But the parents nowadays, they accept it a little bit more. But years ago, forget it, you know. Yeah, back in the day, it was a different, yeah. it was a different yeah. time. Yeah. But today is today. And some of those kids that got thrown out, they're on the street, you know, getting drugs and shit. You know what I mean? So I hope that it wakes up people anyway. Just go for it. If you have a goal, just go for it. But just in in, in, uh, in looking back, man, I admire your career and, and all the chances that you took, all the things that you did. At the end of the day, you were able to – it wasn't the, the, like Roy Shire. He didn't really care for you when you first came in. People knew or suspected, but the fact was – you rose to the top in every promotion that you went to because your passion for the business, your talent for the business, your mind for the business, uh, your persona and everything that you created, and your dependability. You were the perfect, you were the model employee if there ever was one. I mean, straight up, that's the truth, yeah, right? Yeah, but you don't bullshit, Steve. I know that. You so, don't bullshit. Yeah. How could, how could someone ask for a better person? Yeah, and so the name of the, of the book is accepted. And you were always accepted. And the fact that you got to come out and say, hey, here's the bottom line. Yeah. Yes, I'm gay. Yeah. And there's finally freedom. Yeah. I love the book. Yeah. And I'm going to say this. I had a shit pile of notes on my computer. And I didn't get through half of them. And there's many more stories in this book. And it's a, it's a ride that will take you up and down. And you will laugh out loud on some of the stories uh, of the ribs that Pat played. Uh, but it's it's a book. It's written from the heart. I didn't want to just go straight from the book. I wanted to talk about some of the promoters that, that <laughs> Pat had worked for because there's some great learning lessons in there. But if you have any kind of passion for the business or if you just want to hear about a story about a guy that was gay who reached about the highest level you could reach in the business of professional wrestling, a macho, badass, tough business, yeah. I suggest you read Accepted by Pat Patterson because I enjoyed the shit out of it. And it was able for me, Pat, as long as I've known you, as, as much as you've helped me to read your story, and goddamn, I, you had a hell of a life. And for all the, all the things wow. that you had to hide, you always made chicken salad out of chicken <laughs> shit. You, knew you did. And so the glass is always half full. Yeah. And Louie... Uh, yeah. wonderful Louie for yeah. 40 years and, yeah. and God rest his soul he passed away I didn't yeah. I didn't go into that but yeah. uh, you guys just just did your thing and y'all blended with everybody and you, yeah. people loved you yeah I love you Steve thanks for talking to me <laughs> can you imagine Stone Cold Stone Cold 
Macho man I loves me. It's SOB and the history of the business, God damn it. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, wow, this is, this is the compliment. Thank you, Pat. Thank you so much. All right, everybody, give me the go-home cue. It's time to wrap up this podcast and ride off in the sunset. But before I do, I want to thank my guest, Pat Patterson. Pat Patterson helped me out tremendously in my career in the WWE. He really helped out the great one, The Rock, the most electrifying man in the history of sports entertainment, and so many other people, including The Undertaker, Chris Jericho, Cactus Jack, Mankind, and he probably helped DX. I know he's helped Triple H in all kinds of capacities. He's just a wonderful guy, and this book is really a book you got to read. We only glazed over a couple of the subjects in the book, just kind of followed parts of the book, and Pat has already given me his word that we're going to sit down and do part two, totally unscripted, with no outline, just two guys shooting the breeze about the business of professional wrestling. I'm looking forward to talking to Pat once again, just shooting the breeze without any protocol or no agenda, just hanging out. And Pat Patterson is one of the brilliant minds in the history of the business. I've already said this a few times before. If you go to YouTube and just type in Pat Patterson, Ted DiBiase, that match those guys had, Pat Patterson versus Sergeant Slaughter, what was it, 81, whatever the year was, in Madison Square Garden. Man, watch that blade job as Sarge hits right there when he hits that corner turnbuckle. It's a thing of beauty. I hate to say that on the air, but that's what it was, man. Holy smokes. Two guys. Watch the salesmanship in this match. Badass. Badass indeed. Hey, man, let me throw a couple plugs at you while we're doing plugs. Check out Pat's book. I guess you can find it online at Amazon. Use my links. It's called Accepted. This is a really fun read. Pat, I think the reason he was so successful in the business of pro wrestling is because he always liked an audience, and he always loves to tell stories. Anybody who's ever hung out with Pat uh, around the bar in the dressing room, just hanging out, shooting the breeze, Pat loves to tell stories. He tells a story, uh, many stories in his book, and it's a great read, and you'll laugh out loud at some of it, especially some of the ribs. It's a good book. you got to check it out. Hay hey, man. All my T-shirts over at BrokenSkullRanch.com that I wear on Broken Skull Challenge. Uh, we start rolling cameras uh, this Friday. We're going to go through a camera rehearsal. And on Monday, the 29th of August, we start shooting Broken Skull Challenge for CMT. This is the one and only toughest show on television. Lots of pretenders, some contenders, but they ain't nothing like what we got over there at the Broken Skull Challenge. I go to Dulce, California, by way of Texas. The Broken Skull IPA, my beer, made by El Segundo Brewing Company. It's the best IPA in the United States of America. Here in California, you can find it at Whole Foods and Total Wines. If you don't live in California and we can deliver it you to your state, go to BrokenSkullRanch.com. There's a link for it. You can buy the best beer in the world. The Steve Austin Broken Skull Cold Steel Knife. Yeah, that's right. This is the baddest knife money can buy with a four-inch blade. All United States of America parts assembled in Taiwan to save the working man a buck or two. Check it out on Amazon. Use my link. That's where you're going to find your best price. Anything Steve Austin, you find at BrokenSkullRanch.com. I want to say thank you uh, for supporting the sponsors of the Steve Austin Podcast because they're the ones that let me do this for you free twice a week. So big thanks, my man, Diamond Dallas Page at ddpyoga.com. Go to ddpyoga.com slash Austin to get 20% off the DDP Yoga program and three months of full access to the DDP Yoga Now app. Big thanks to DraftKings. Go to DraftKings.com. Use the promo code UNLEASH to play for free with your first deposit. Big thanks to Onnit. Go to Onnit.com slash Steve to get 10% off your order. Big thanks to CarnivoreClub.co. Use my promo code Steve to get 15% off your first box to True Car and, of course, to Amazon. They've been supporting this podcast since day one. If you use my Amazon links whenever you do any online shopping, Amazon will kick back a couple of bucks to the podcast. It doesn't cost you nothing extra. Ain't no hidden fees. You buy whatever you plan on buying, and you will help out the podcast in the process. And you can find my Amazon links by going to podcastone.com, click on the Killer Deals button in the top right corner of the page, and then hit the Steve Austin Show button. I got Amazon links for Amazon USA, Amazon UK, and Amazon Canada. So go to podcastone.com, click the Killer Deals button in the top right corner, then click on the Steve Austin Show. All my great sponsors are there. All my Amazon links are there. You can bookmark it and save it and do it all in one click. Amazon. 
helps us pay our production costs, and they don't charge you nothing extra. That's a great way to help this podcast keep running two days a week for free. Hey, folks, keep listening. The 60-second AP News headlines are coming up next. Until next time, my Tuesday show, Family Friendly. I'm talking with the best tag team in the world today, the Revival NXT Tag Team Champions. They are Scott Dawson and Dash Wilder, two badass cats. It's a very candid conversation. I had a pleasure talking to them. Until then, my name is Steve Austin, and I will catch your ass down the road. Download new episodes of Steve Austin Unleashed every Thursday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. Stay tuned for the latest AP News headlines from Podcast One right after this. P Update, I'm Carlotta Bradley. Southeastern governors are dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Matthew. Florida Governor Rick Scott. The brunt of our problem is, is really right now in northeast Florida. I'm going to be here until people uh, get back. I want them back to work. I want them, the businesses open. I want people back to school. Uh, I want people in their homes, and I want them to have power. South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley says power needs to be restored and roads fixed so evacuees can get back home. We are dealing with flooding. We are dealing with trees down. We are going to deal with debris removal. And so we ask for your patience. North Carolina Governor Pat McCrory says three people have died in the state, so residents need to understand just how bad conditions are. From Raleigh all the way east, stay off the roads, stay in your house, watch the football games on TV, Bunker up. Three people have died in Georgia, four in Florida. AP Update, I'm Carlotta Bradley.